Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and this is going to be a tough movie to review. I can't believe it already, because last week I reviewed Highlander, the first film of the franchise. In my opinion, and everyone else's out there, it's simply one of the, of the best action-adventure fantasies ever made, blending in with comedy, romance, drama, Shows conflict here and there. It's like a fairy tale in a mix. You know, focusing on a Scottish uh, Highlander who's the immortal, who's about to fight against his enemy, and every time he chops off the head, he'll be able to bring all the immortal life together and he'll be able to explore. He's joined in with uh, his best friend. A mentor Ramirez, yeah. who's an Egyptian immortal, which could have been a Spaniard <laughs> in a way. And of course, I know the immortal himself, the Highlander, is Connor McCloud. Yeah. And I did the review as a tribute to Sean Connery, who passed away just recently. And the story, of course, was created by. Gregory Wyden, yeah, it's pronounced Wyden, not Wyden. I know, yeah, like like Biden, <laughs> who just won presidency. Yeah, he's going to become the next president of the United States. Yeah, now that the election's finally over. And another one who just passed away recently is Alex Trebek, who just uh, fought 18 months of pancreatic cancer. Yeah. yeah, the game show host who um, hosted the, the game show that's been long running called Jeopardy. Yeah, the American, the America's favorite quiz show. Yeah. yeah. And I know it's really sad having to hear this because I had a feeling this was going to end or, or they're probably going to have a new host to take over. Which I, I know, but let, let's hope we can remember him by. Because now he's going to be up in heaven with Sean Connery. Imagine they end up doing a Celebrity Jeopardy for real. <laughs> up in heaven, though. Yeah, like the SNL uh, skit that became very popular for. But now, I'm going to be reviewing the sequel to the original film. And just so you know, I'm not going to review all the other sequels. I'm just going to keep it this way for now. Maybe in the future, who knows. But I'm just doing it as a tribute for Sean Connery. And that is Highlander 2. Well, in the original theatrical version, it was called The Quickening. People say it was a silly title. Well, according to Siskel and Hebrew, of course. Which actually means uh, the powerful energy where they can bring back someone to life. And it's explained in the first Highlander. The power that Connor McCloud had used. But in the alternate version, it's called simply Renegade. Which is the same movie, but they added um, alternate scenes. Um, exactly the way it was supposed to be where it's more concise because the theatrical version however turned out to be one of the worst films ever made yet alone the worst sequel mostly because they reconned the first film that did piss me off when I saw this it had a lot of large plot holes the characters were poorly developed which that I don't understand because I, I thought um, it was great to see both McCloud and Ramirez back again, but I kind of wish they were in more screen time. Well, well, perhaps Ramirez needed more screen time. And they still have the great chemistry. And I, I love uh, Virginia Matson. I mean, taking over to play a, a character named uh, Luis Marcus. And then you have the villain named... General Katana was played by Michael Ironside. 
So with those characters alone, it can't be that bad. So that I don't understand. Because they weren't the problem. Uh, but back to this, um, it's also because they had a confusing story structure, abundance of subplots, which led to the planet Zeist and the the mortals being aliens. I mean, come on. Makes no sense whatsoever. And even worse, it was edited poorly, too. I mean, horrible editing. It just went all over the place. That's how bad that movie turned out to be. But the Renegade cut really fixed all that. And what's even better, they did actually uh, went back to what the first film story turned out to be. And even though his first love was Heather, but we began to find out what happened to um, Brenda Wyatt, you know, who was played by Roxanne Hart. They did finally explain what happened here, and, and then they make the plot more concise. So now they explain about the shield that was happening, mostly because McCloud was involved in this project, joining him with his partners. Well, anyway. But let, let's try to begin with this review, because this, <laughs> again, it's not going to be easy. The movie stars Christopher Lambert, or Bayard, Sean Connery, Virginia Madsen, Michael Ironside, Alan Rich, John C. McGinley, because you know, he's been in a lot of great movies here and there. And he's always in up playing villains sometimes. And I know he's in the show Scrubs. Philip Brock, Rusty Schrimmer, Ed Tuco, Steve Grives, Jimmy Murray, Pete uh, Antico, and Peter Baskasi. It's written by Peter Bellwood, along with Brian Clemmings and William N. Penzer, yeah, which is based on the movie Highlander by Gregory Wyden. And it's directed by Russell McKay, who did the first movie. Now we begin with the quickening. Um, the film begins 500 years ago on the planet Zeist, where a last meeting is being held between the members of the rebellion against a ruthless and corrupt leadership, the main villain of the story named General Katana, who's played by Michael Ironside, is joined in with a wise sorcerer named Juan Ramirez, as you may have remembered him from the first film, played by Sean Connery, who's the one who guides the rebellion, and he chose a man, which happens to be a man of great destiny, Connor McCloud, also from the first film, played by Christopher Lambert. And they're chosen to be leading against Katana, which then Ramirez uses the quickening to explain that it's kind of a magic, but it creates a bond between him and McCloud that's more stronger than death. You know, and it's a powerful source and energy that they can do anything they can. So if something goes wrong, they'll bring someone back to life here and there. Or they'll help them out whenever they make their call. So then Katana and his troops would attack and crush the entire rebellion, leading both Ramirez and McCloud to be put on trial by Zeiss Priest. They're the aliens. Unbelievable. Or so. But they're not really the aliens. I mean, because I know this is how fucked up the plot is. And the story. But they sentence them and other criminals to exile on Earth, which they'll be considered to be immortals being locked into their ageless lives and they'll fight each other until only one is left yeah which at this rate they're gonna chop their heads off and then they'll become the immortals so the survivor will win the prize chose to remain on earth as a mortal person and to live out their days or just go back to Zeist and their past crimes will be forgiven but Katana was very unsatisfied with their decision and the sentence had to be executed Going flashback to what happened, all taking place in McLeod's childhood days in Scotland before he became a Highlander. 
And this was before he, he got to meet Ramirez and all. Of course, what he didn't know was that Ramirez was there the whole time. <sighs> Pretty fucked up if you think about it. Because <laughs> the stupid script is just so fucked up in so many ways. But yes, I mean, this is where we begin to know the whole story about how it happened. You know, how McLeod was going to be chosen to defeat the Kurgan. Of course, played by Clancy Brown, the main villain. And also because, since he did destroy him, and then all the other immortals have been destroyed, that he's going to be the only one. And that's how it happened, you know, where they qualified that the Zeiss aliens, <laughs> unbelievable, are being reborn as immortals on Earth. But Ramirez claimed that he's only a thousand years old from Egyptian, only to be exiled by Zeiss to Earth in the 16th century. Yeah. So, of course, in 1985, already been destroyed by McLeod, he now marries uh, the forensic expert for the NYPD, you know, Brenda White, which happens to be his second lover after Heather. And hoping that, as it was um, explained, McLeod saying that the prize will give him the ability to know of the thoughts and dreams of all people on Earth. But it was never mentioned much here. But then we go all the way flash forward to August 1994, where the ozone layer is being faded and was completely gone in a matter of months, which millions of people have perished from the unfiltered solar radiation that also includes uh, Brenda and just before she died Brenda asked Connor to promise that he would solve the problem of the ozone layer and he did once um, 1999 came along when um, McLeod had now become the supervisor of a scientific team that's being headed by Dr. Alan Nyman who's played by Alan Rich so they had to create their project called um, the Electromagnetic uh, Shield, which is the kind of, um, which is, uh, I'm trying to, which is going to be able to protect Earth from radiation. A cloud and nine mile are proud to save humanity, but the shield has mean to contend the planet that's no longer be able to see the sky as well as the stars or sunlight perhaps yeah so it's going to take over the sun's energy of the high average global temperature and high humidity so but unable to see the skies for decades many began to suffer from depression and loss of hope while human society continues to decline all due to violence greed and crime yeah, pretty messed up. And now we get to the future, which was 2024, where the S.H.I.E.L.D. has now fallen under the control of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Corporation that's run by Chief Executive David Blake, who's played by John C. McGinley, and who actually imposes heavy feats on countries that, design, that desires to continue the protection from solar radiation. Well, we meet a former employee of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Corporation, TSC for short, named Louise Marcus, who's played by Virginia Madsen, who uh, happens to be a radical activist, who's joined in as a member of a radio, who's actually joined in as a member of a radical activist group that believes that the Onso layer has healed, but the S.H.I.E.L.D. Corporation had kept the secret so the S.H.I.E.L.D. can continue providing more profit and all. Now McCloud, who is a frail old man, lives a solitary life you know, while watching a performance of Wagner's Goddard Dama Rung, you know, an operetta, also trying to remember Ramirez as he appears on the, his passive Zeist. And meanwhile, on Zeist, 
General Katana, who is now living, considers that McClellan may choose to return to Zeiss or rather die on Earth of national causes. Unwilling to take that chance, Katana had sent those two henchmen, Corda and Renault, to kill him. Which, that's where, of course, McLeod actually had a small cut after that that random uh, girl just came by at the local bar. Yeah, he, he was actually uh, just having a drink. He was just uh, tuning in to the song, which happens to be this, the Queen song, Magic, on the jukebox. I don't even know who this random girl was, but this just happened out of nowhere. And just knocks him with the bottle of... of um, alcohol and yeah got cut and then suddenly both um, Corda and Renault had came running around in their hoverboards ready to attack um, McLeod just as um, just as um, um, just as Marcus came around and just found um, McLeod hoping that he'll be the only one to actually stop the shield corporation and be able to get back to the way it was you know trying to destroy the shield of course with Corda and Renault already died you know having their heads cut off well one well one actually got his head cut off um, from the the wheel of, of a vehicle that was driving by and then and then uh, the other, while well, the other is already, you know, flying around, but he later had his head cut off, and now all of the the immortal power just went straight into McLeod. So now he became more younger, wiser, and better than ever before. Yeah. So anyway, uh, both Mar so Marcus um, again was asking help for McLeod to take down the shield that he helped create and he already won the prize you know to become immortal and going back to Glencoe Scotland the location of his death from the first movie Romero suddenly came back to life after he's being called by uh, McLeod only that he wants up in a location which turned out to be a local theater where they were actually having a performance called Hamlet. Yeah, from Shakespeare. Yeah, which apparently the actor calls him a shithead. And then soon he actually went to McLeod's location, which seems quite different now. I mean, everything's all futuristic. You know, he spotted the TVs, and then he went to this uh, local tailor's store where he acquired some new clothes. And wants up transportation all the way taken from this particular plane. So, while meanwhile, General Katana arrives from Zeiss, determined to kill McLeod himself as just as soon as he arrives. He just came to take over control uh, through the subway car. Yeah, he actually had to drove the entire uh, subway filled with millions of uh, passengers around. They're all flying around. All of them, you know, getting killed. You know, their faces being smashed into the windows. Um, they're all flying around. There's even one guy where you can see his uh, eyeballs bulging out. I mean, this is fucking insane. So, he did speed it out of control. And then he comes briefly to confront uh, McLeod on holy ground where they're being forbidden to fight, taunting him before leaving. Then Romero then found McLeod and Louise as they make a plan to take down the shield. Of course, um, Katana allows himself to join with um, David Blake, who explains the energy required to counteract and disable the shield at this point that can threaten Earth. You know, just after, you know, both um, 
McLeod and just of course when both McLeod and and Katana had a a sword fight you know, inside um, his uh, house. Then of course um, Ramirez had came. Finally, um, finally met uh, McLeod, hoping they'll be together to join with um, Louise to destroy the Shield, and that's so they had to go all the way to the Shield Corporation as soon as they can, which then they had to. This is going to sound funny. Once they try to enter the the Shield Corporation, they're being shot down by guards. Yeah, all blood starting to come out, but thinking they're dead, and and then uh, Marcus is is hidden in the trunk, thinking that they kidnap her. Um, but once they went over there to <laughs> um, the health um, room, well, they actually found both of them alive. <laughs> yeah, the doctor just uh, fainted, and then they had to to go all the way, hoping that they'll be able to destroy it. But only um, Ramirez had sacrificed himself to save both um, McLeod and Marcus from the death trap. So now, already with Blake being killed, you know, being thrown out of the, the corporation, now both McLeod has one final battle with Katana, um, hoping to kill him. You know, joining in with uh, Marcus as they were driving around, but hoping that you know once they finally um, defeated, um, but once he finally defeats Katana, that's where um, McLeod succeeds in disrupting and removing the shield, joining in with Marcus, along with many people on Earth to see the stars and sky for the first time. In everyone's life. Uh, well, they did explain a little bit better too in in a following theatrical ending in the UK, which added an alternate ending, which was known as simply the fairy tale ending. Uh, I don't want to get that away here. Now I'm going to get to the Renegade cut, which at this rate we begin to find out now that they took out the subplot involving Planet Zeist and Immortals being aliens and, and all these flashbacks going around here and there. But this one was handled better. The editing was not poorly going all over the place. They actually got this right. They added some new scenes here and there. The story was so much well told, even though, yes, it does have flaws. I, I mean, I think for the most part, it did told it uh, more straight here. So that's where we found out how McLeod and the other immortals are, are human beings, being born with the energy called the quickening, makes them invincible to death unless they are being beheaded. McLeod and Ramirez, now both immortals, and inhabit on society on Earth to be date record history during the time where magic and advanced technology had exist which society is now being ruled by of course General Katana who's the military leader and, and the immortal and now joining in with McLeod and Ramirez for Ramirez, Ramirez decided that McLeod would be the new leader of the revolution being used as the agent of nameless magic to bond their souls together. Which at this way would have been the quickening. But McLeod and Ramirez are being captured by Katana's forces, which the priests and the chief judges are overseeing the case to exile them, to exile them and other immortals, criminals to various points of the Earth's future. Long after the society has been fallen and forgotten, if one immortal's exiles um, is able to kill the others, the immortal will win the prize. Full amnesty for their crimes and their choice, returning to their true home in the distant past, or remains in the future and now live as a mortal who will age and eventually die. 
But, but before they're being separated, Ramirez had promised that bond between the souls mean they can always find each other even beyond death. Which are then being transported to different points of the future. It's going to help for it. So now Ramirez is being reborn as an ancient Egypt. Now being cunning to a morally guided warrior. While MacLeod is being reborn as a Scottish Highland in the 16th century. Apparently not remembering his first life in the distant past. Because now he's going to become the immortal. Soon after being found by Ramirez. Who trained him to fight. Exactly like how... We remember, um, and you know how the, the story goes, of course. And yes, all the story remains the same here and there, which led to those flaws. So, yes, the flashbacks have been rearranged. They added some scenes to tell the story right, and they had minor changes too, which we begin to follow. You know, taking back to where it all happened, we begin to find out about, you know, Brenda, who's actually in her deathbed due to the solar radiation poisoning, so we got to find her. It was a very sad scene, too. And then, um, they also, again, try to find a way to uh, destroy the shield so they can save Earth. And... And it follows it exactly what it was told here. Um, and, um, of course, even at the end of the movie, McLeod did release the quickening energy to overload and destroy the shield, indicating that he might become immortal again in, in the process. But he will embrace Louise, and, and the two would vanish into the burst of light, rising into the sky and all. So exactly how it, it happened. Yeah, I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but I'm just trying to focus here. It, it's really hard. But I think I'm just going to say this too. The theatrical cut is a piece of shit. God awful. Avoid that one if you want to see the actual cut done exactly right. Um... The Renegade cut to me is the real deal. It definitely follows it perfectly. And it is kind of a shame too that uh, from Russell Mulcahy, who directed this movie, the fact that he was so furious that his cut got butchered to death by the production company. Of course, this movie being released by Interstar, releasing instead of uh, 20th Century Fox, yeah, this is an independent company that they had to find a way to release a film to uh, finance it and all. Um, they did what they could, but they failed. <laughs> yeah, kind of felt bad for him too, because this is not exactly what he wanted. And not only that, but even during the f the film's world premiere, I heard that he actually walked out after 15 minutes. From the beginning. Yeah, I don't blame him. Because the way the... It had to do with studio interference. Because the way the studio had, had diminished his cut. It does have some nice action in the movie. I mean, I had no problem with that. I just wish there were more, though. Um, again, I fought... In my opinion, I fought the performances. At least to them. I'm, I was happy that we got to see both... Um, Lambert and Connery back together as McLeod and Ramirez. They had great chemistry together. It's always fun to actually, you know, come up with all these funny dialogues, even if they are cheesy. But they're so memorable, even if you think about that. Even though Michael Ironside did overhammered his performance, trying to make it sound more like Kurgan here. I do thought that uh, his character was, um, I mean, he's no Kurgan, I know, but I thought he was actually great, an excellent villain right there. I mean, exactly what we expected. I mean, hey, you know, he's an excellent actor no, no matter what. And Virginia Madsen, I mean, incredibly gorgeous as Louise Marcus. 
And she wasn't bad at all either. And I, I always love her. I mean, she was in movies, of course, like uh, Candyman, The Prophecy, with Christopher Walken, the first one that is. Um, she's always, she's always been beautiful. Um, so I even I didn't mind the chemistry here too, but I I do wish that you know maybe they could have added a a love scene between her and McCloud. I wish that could have been added. I wish they they didn't have to go for the two henchmen. That was pretty much unnecessary. But I understand maybe because. This is just probably a setup so he can become the immortal and become more younger than ever before instead of being weak as a frail old man. Which I know I did have some trouble, you know, having to hear um, his voice, you know, sound so raspily and gravely, you know, for Christopher Lambert to do while wearing, while uh, having this. Uh, old guy's makeup um, that they had to give him. So he does look like an old man already. <laughs> yeah, and I guess I could see why they had to fix um, using ADR to actually edit his voice. Because I know people had trouble you know, having to hear his uh, particular soft voice that he got. I mean, because he is a French actor. Um, and um, yeah, I, I also had a problem with this random girl, and I think it had to be also played by Virginia Madsen under that uh, makeup, wearing that fat suit. Like, um, I don't know, who, I don't even know who this girl is, but it's it's like she appears out of nowhere. It seems like I think they both met, something like that, and she's a bitch. She actually uh, takes the bottle of alcohol and just smashed him. <sighs> Unbelievable. Um, the special effects in the movie. Now, in 2004, of course, they did use CGI effects um, that they had to alter to, to fix some of the problems. Because I didn't think the special effects had any problems uh, whatsoever. They, it was uh, well done for what, for at the time that they did it. Of course, the film being shot in Argentina for its 34 million budget, and I know it, it was a big flop for the theatrical cut. That is, um, but apparently, though, I, I think they they did what they can to actually fix this problem. Yeah. Um, but it didn't look that bad at all. Um, you know, with, where they show the shield and they show the sky and s you see how all all that had been blocked into it. And I, I like how they went for the feature setting too for the film, trying to make it more Blade Runner-esque in a way. You know, because the, the whole metropolis looks as futuristic as they can be. I mean, they look a little dated at times. I mean, hey... You never know what the future had to look like before all these HD TVs and all this other stuff could have been used and all. But they did what they could, and and I thought it looked so really neat. So I I really enjoyed that setting, and I really enjoyed what they were going for. I think the story to me was more concise, a whole lot better in the Renegade cut than it did in the Quickening. And that's exactly what they could have had done to make the series uh, better. And I think the movie could have been a lot better if they just didn't recon the first film. I mean, just keep it the way it should be, man. I think they would have handled the story a lot better. And more understanding, too. And I almost wish that Sean Connery had plenty of screen time, even though he was given some laughable scenes here, you know, where he just came back to... McLeod's location, and then everything seems to change, and it just seems like it was pretty laughable at times. You know, like we're really in for that. <laughs> and the fact that he goes on a plane, which I know in this version, because um, they did use models to create the, the airplane going by, but then they use CGI to create the plane running as smoothly as possible. 
where this is where he, he just talks about how he came from his country, his land, and he's talk he's actually, you know, flirting or <laughs> making conversations with um, this beautiful uh, passenger. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was just watching a, a safety video on the plane. <laughs> And joking around. I mean, that sort of thing. Anyway, I also didn't mind John C. McGinley in the role of uh, David Blake. Yeah, he was an asshole, the character that is. The way he's treating everyone, too. Especially Alan Nyman, too. And, um, and I know there was a scene in the movie, too, where um, Katana was uh, taking a cab and this cab driver claiming that this guy's like came from a, a heavy metal band <laughs> but he's not and, and Katana's just going around destroying the windshield of the taxi and then just so he can take him to the place where he's going to I know when they both met uh, yeah there's when both uh, McLeod and him met after all these years <laughs> yeah he calls him a jerk <laughs> To Katana. Yeah, you know, you know the rest. And it's worth watching. I would say, in my opinion, just stick to the the Renegade cuts. Perhaps the 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 Renegade cut that was from the 2004 version, because which is the special edition, because that's the one that makes the film much better, despite of the flaws that the film had gotten. And stay away from the theatrical version, unless you're curious enough to check it out. That's fine, but... So that's just exactly what we have to have in mind for this particular sequel. It plays out like a standalone, you know. Anyway, that's Highlander 2. The Quickening. Well, it could have been worse. It would have been called Electric Boogaloo, for sorts. <sighs> Whatever. I give The Quickening zero stars, but I will give Renegade three and a half, just to be fair, despite of the flaws it got. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and remember, there could be only one. And I'll see you later. Bye.